Namaste. So, as we said yesterday, we have finished with the exposition of the entire esoteric teaching. That is, the spiritual path all the way from sex to superconsciousness, from the first chakra to the seventh. And each chakra has its own form of yoga. So the complete teaching, the complete esoteric teaching, consists of all these different flavors and styles and methods of yoga. And they have to be applied in the proper way so that we can make spiritual advancement and attain enlightenment. Not just one method, not just one chakra, but all seven. So that means there's an enormous amount of material to learn and understand. And after talking about this on yesterday's video, some of our students got upset. <laughs> I guess they thought I was talking to them personally, but actually I'm talking to the whole audience. And what I can see or what I can, what you're letting me see of, of uh, your understanding of this teaching um, is not complete. I don't hear, for example, the terminology being used correctly. Uh, this, this led to a big conversation on our private chat channel that brought out some very interesting points that the students are feeling overwhelmed, they're feeling confused, uh, their thinking is kind of fuzzy, they don't really feel like they understand, you know, the whole teaching, uh, the overview. And, of course, that gives me pause for thought that have I presented it properly? And I took the time to go through and make a catalog of all of our series, all 70 some odd playlists on this channel, and identify which chakra they belong to or which chakra they're focused on. <laughs> because knowing the whole thing, it's very hard for me to just focus on one small area. And I think the problem is that the terminology is not properly understood. Now, we covered this way back in the beginning of this channel in the secret, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Matrix Learning series. And I'm gonna put a link up here for the Matrix Learning. Uh, you should please go and see it. If you haven't seen it yet, you really need to see it. Because this series gives you the tools to wrap your mind around a, such a huge body of information as this teaching. So not only are there 630 some odd videos in this series channel, but there's also many books that we refer to that we use as source material. And yes, you should be familiar with those too. So how do you handle so much information? Well, of course, you have to increase your mental efficiency, your reading and comprehension ability, and so on. So to do that, we have put together a nice package called Matrix Learning. And this is going to bring you skills that will enable you to learn anything you want anything, any skill, any practical application. And so it seems like a good time, since we're now focusing on the practical application of the teaching, to go back and remind everybody, this is something you really need to take a look at. And the other thing I want you to take a look at is being integrity. Most of us come to think of integrity, ethics, legality, morality, right and wrong, good and bad, and so forth, in terms of external values. 
And this is how we've been trained. Uh, right and wrong is something given by religion or it's given by uh, legality, by the laws of the government, or it's given by ethics, some kind of a value system uh, by which we judge our activities and so on. But all of these are external, which means they're virtues, they're external qualities that other people can see in us. What about <laughs> the real integrity? The real integrity is a state of being in which one cannot harm oneself or others. And that is something that is arrived at through spiritual advancement, through learning, through compassion. Uh, there are many roads to being integrity. But I think the main one is realizing that such a thing can exist. That we shouldn't judge ourselves or others by external system of values. But by the absolute system of values, whether that person is making a contribution to life or taking away from life, destroying life. If a person is destroying life, even in a subtle way, that they are not, they do not have integrity. They are not a sapurisa, a man of integrity, as the Buddha would say. Uh, purisa comes from Sanskrit purusha, meaning a man. Really, it means an enjoyer. Uh, and sat, of course, is truth. So a truthful man has to admit to himself, first of all, whether he is benefiting life on this planet or whether he's against it. And so we see so many people, for example, scientists, with no sense of whether the stuff they're working on is going to be good or bad for people whether it's going to be beneficial or harmful to life. And of course, many things that have been discovered, uh, we can go all the way back to the hammer, <laughs> can be used either for constructive or destructive purposes. So the real question lies in our intent. If our intent is to benefit ourselves alone, that's selfish and destructive, and that's out integrity. But if our aim is to benefit every life form, every sentient being, then we have integrity, not as a virtue, but as a state of being. It shouldn't be something we even have to think about, whether this is right or wrong. It should be intuitive. So this state of sapurisa, a man of truth, a man of integrity, is something that we all should strive for. These are the two series that I would have you watch before you watch anything else on this channel. Because these are our fundamental values as sadhus. If we take an antagonistic stance toward other spiritual paths, other practices, huh, we're not doing anybody a favor, especially ourselves. On the other hand, if we support others who are making a, a bad impression, a, doing bad actions, destructive actions toward life on this planet, then we ourselves are out of integrity. So this is the test. Are you working for the benefit of all sentient beings? Uh, of course, it's easy to rationalize and say, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> My uh, atomic bomb plant is making sure that peace will, <laughs> will prevail on this planet through mutually assured destruction. Yeah, great integrity. <laughs> See, I can talk like this because back in high school, I was a prodigy in two subjects, music and physics. And my physics work, including winning several science fair prizes and stuff like that, led to an opportunity for scholarship at MIT in nuclear physics. 
So everybody was telling me, man, you should take that, you know. Playing the flute is not going to make you rich or successful, famous or anything like that, you know. You, you should become a nuclear physicist, become a scientist. Then I thought, wait a minute, what kind of a job can I get with a degree in nuclear physics? And working for the Atomic Energy Commission, <laughs> making bombs. So I said, no, this was the time, remember, this is the time of the Vietnam War, 1965. And I said, no, I'm not going to make bombs. I'm not going to study physics. I'm going to go to conservatory where I also had a scholarship and study music, musical composition and performance. So am I rich? No. Am I famous? No. <laughs> But do I have integrity? Yes. And oh, interesting uh, post, post allude to this story. Another friend of mine in the same school, John, got uh, or actually accepted this MIT scholarship. And he and several other scholarship students carpooled together uh, from our area, northern New Jersey, to go up to MIT to accept it. And on the way up, the driver fell asleep. The car went off the road, hit a bridge abutment, and everybody was killed. This is back in the days before airbags and crumple zones and good car design. Uh, and even seat belts. I don't think we even had seat belts in those days. So they were all killed. If I had accepted that scholarship, I would probably have been in that car with my friend. So as it was, I got to attend his funeral. So I look back on this experience with a great deal of gratefulness, thankfulness, that I had the integrity to go against everybody's advice, my friends and family, other students and everything, and to reject that scholarship on principle because it would be harmful to the rest of humanity, to the rest of really all sentient beings. And by becoming a musician, maybe I wasn't doing anybody a big favor, but at least I wasn't becoming a major force of destruction. So as it turned out, my musical activities led to being introduced to my guru, and that's how my whole career as a sadhaka started. So I want to impress you first with the uh, necessity of learning the basic terminology of this teaching. I don't hear anybody, even on our chat group, which is probably the most serious students of this teaching. I don't hear anybody using the terminology that we have presented this teaching with. For example, the Chatur Darshanam, the four views of the Absolute, given first by Shankaracharya, and later on uh, the Buddha, and so many other great teachers. But instead, People narrow down their focus. Huh? See, we've been trained like this. We've been trained by schooling, especially, to hate looking up words in the dictionary or whatever source their definitions are found in. But this is absolutely necessary to comprehend this teaching. And if you don't do it, you're going to have a very fuzzy, blurry idea of what this thing is all about. And certainly you will not be able to apply it. So, I'm adding this video to the playlist for Natrix Learning, so that when you watch it, you'll see the rest of the playlist in the discovery pane on the right side of the uh, viewing pane. You should go back and watch it. Here's the link again. And I hope by next time, you're able to ask me more questions, because I need your questions to get feedback about how you're doing so I can structure the future of this teaching to help you apply it. Om Tat Sat. Voodoo Sarnai.